Well, howdy there, Internet people. It's Bo again. Don't worry, you're not watching the wrong channel. Just roll with it. Hello, y'all. I'm back, and we are about to start the Libertarian Socialist Caucus panel. The Libertarian Socialist Caucus of what, you may ask? Well, not the DSA, the Libertarian Party. Without further ado, welcome. How are y'all tonight? Doing great. How are you? Oh, Thank pretty you. damn good. Oh, fantastic as well. You look tired. A little bit, but also <laughs> still actually enjoying myself quite a bit. This has been awesome. a really, really, really fun day. And a lot of... It's been cool to see how everything interconnects. And even across the diversity of our uh, participants. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Does the does the skeleton have a name? It does, but ah, uh, it's not important. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. <laughs> Uh, so anyways, we are members of the Libertarian Socialist Caucus of the Libertarian Party, and yeah, I, what, what did we say we would start with? Introductions, and then, yeah, let's do an introduction. I am Logan Marie Glitterbaum, if you did not know already and are just tuning in. She, her, um, you know, all, I helped found this caucus, but before that I was 
and still am a, a writer and fellow at the Center for Stateless Society, among other things, and uh, and a member of the Industrial Workers of the World and all that fun jazz. So, yeah. One of y'all. You can go first, Mike. Oh, go ahead, Paul. <laughs> okay. Uh, so my name is Paul, uh, and I am a actually a dual member, not just of the Libertarian Party of Libertarian Socialist Caucus, but also of the DSA's Libertarian Socialist Caucus. Um, I am an at-large member of the executive board of the Libertarian Party of New York, um, a the campaign manager for Stacey Pressman, who's running as a Libertarian candidate for mayor of New York City. Um, and I've been in a, just a, uh, too many different positions within state, county, even a few things on the national party level. Um, and I've, I, I, I like to think that I'm a, I'm a big believer in the horseshoe theory of, a, of idea quality, where you know, if an idea, you know, some ideas are so good that in practice are kind of bad ideas because they're too idealistic. Other ideas are so bad that they cycle back around into being good. And that's kind of how I feel like the Libertarian Socialist Caucus of the Libertarian Party is. Um, because for most people, when they hear that phrase, they think three things first. No, stop it. What are you doing? And yet, uh, the caucus has actually had a surprising amount of success, especially in, um, especially in convincing people who would have presumed that you were making it up when you said the phrase Libertarian Socialist to not only see the ideology as valid, but to genuinely approach libertarian socialists as allies in attempts to fight against the state, um, despite often mis completely misunderstanding us or, or sometimes tokenizing us and, and uh, all, all sorts of uh, problematic ways that libcaps often interact with us. There really has been a culture shift in the libertarian party where having the real libertarian left um, become a part of the party has allowed for a, a, just an entire different mental conception of what the party is to libertarians. And I think that's been like really important work that, that this caucus has done. Yay. Uh, I am Mike Shipley. Um, I'm going through kind of a rogue phase right now. I don't really have any official um, titles or responsibilities with the party. Um, my sort of like the impulse that kind of led me there. So I am a recovered ANCAP. Um, I found my way to libertarian socialism through, uh, my responsibility as chair of the gender and sexual minority caucus of the party at the time. Um, I was looking around for, um, I just kind of, you know, well, I mean, it's not a surprise because, everything is property rights to ANCAPs. So I was looking for additional like support um, to accomplish what my responsibility was and, and go figure there's nowhere to look really but left libertarianism. And, um, and the more I looked into it, the more I realized like, hey, it isn't just like queer analysis here, but um, it's everything else that not only also makes sense, but also actually doesn't really contradict the national party platform in the first place. And it's kind of funny because like, you know, since I was discovering it on my own, like I didn't quite understand that, like, this is actually socialism and this is potentially actually communism, depending like who you ask or how they self identify, um, stumbled into that one accidentally, which is a thing that I do. Um, but you know, anyway, I noticed kind of like as I became self-aware that others around me were maybe becoming self-aware too. And maybe the way that I use my vocabulary was starting to resonate. In fact, that's how I met Logan um, is that we, you know, it just, you know, we, we started knowing each other and, and next thing you know, there's like a critical mass of, of organizing energy and that's where the Lipsock caucus came from. So here we are yeah. and let's, see what happens next yeah i mean i i trolled my way into finding y'all uh in a weird way because i was just hanging out on facebook bonding with my brother at the time um my new my new stepbrother and uh well not so new anymore but at the time 
and he we ended up like just bonding over trolling and caps because we both very much were not that but at the same time the more we ended up going and hanging out and trolling them the more we ended up finding allies amongst them and it was the weirdest thing and you know they we found other libertarians who we who criticized the libertarians that uh, who who had the same criticisms of libertarianism that my brother and I as left wing anarchists had, and so we realized there was an opportunity for outreach. There was an opportunity to find allies, and that we could indeed actually use this as a avenue for that um and still troll the hell out of the you know shitty vulgar libertarians um and definitely try and drive out all the fascists and right authoritarians um who but that's when yeah i stumbled into meeting mikester somehow on facebook and we, God, what did we, we worked on the outright Libertarian Caucus first because I believe you outreached to me about that randomly. I think you added me and then you asked if I could help you uh, come up with ideas to potentially rewrite the platform to be more radical and more queer focused because at the time you were worried about the fact that it, basically was just an attempt to sell paleo libertarianism to uh, to the queer community without actually asking in the queer community what their needs were. So that's when you know I saw an opportunity. I don't really care about political parties as much, but if I could help shift a caucus towards, a much radical a much more radical platform and a more queer focused platform then that was something that was good um so i definitely enjoyed the hell out of helping with that and it just kind of cascaded from there i think the povertarians happened after that, or I, I I don't know if that was already a thing and the, just my no, involvement. Right. You got, got it. Right. Yeah, but my involvement with that ended up happening after that, and that was interesting. It was mainly, I mean, I wasn't too involved at all, <sighs> and still haven't been, other than helping run the suite and the pizza party last uh, convention. But it was it was interesting, and I like the idea of recentering libertarianism of the working class and making it accessible to them, regardless of where they lied on the economic ideology spectrum. It was more about making it more available to to people based on, you know, regardless of class um, and making it more accessible for working class people specifically who are often not catered to in libertarian circle and right libertarian circles um, other than being told to become an entrepreneur or an agorist. Um, Exactly. Yeah, no, exactly. It, oh, you don't have you don't have the money. Like, find a venture capitalist or or do a fucking crowdfunding campaign. Come on, it's not that hard. Like, 
sure, it's not hard for you. You had your parents helping you and shit, or you had friends who in, who invested in you. Like, not everybody's got that shit. You know, some people barely got people they can rely on, let alone anything like that. Um, so it's definitely, it was definitely refreshing. And then after that, we saw the uh, Audacious Caucus after the great James Weeks stripped for us the first time. And when I say the first time, I mean you should come check out the cabaret on Tuesday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Central he, uh, on dlive.tv slash coup de gras, as well as on a number of other platforms. Uh, possibly not Facebook because the cabaret does include some nudity, but, uh, yeah, so not Facebook, but we will have, um, it on the re-education YouTube channel and hopefully Vermin Supreme's YouTube channel on Twitch as well. So we're super excited for that. Anyways, enough plugs. Hell yeah. <laughs> Libertarian Socialist Caucus. Why the hell we founded this after the Audacious Caucus. The Audacious Caucus was about, you know, giving the middle finger to respectability politics. And, you know, it really started with James Weeks stripping on stage instead of doing an actual speech. And it was... It was beautiful, and it, it escalated to us waving dildos on C-SPAN, which was absolutely wonderful. Me and my partner enjoyed that, and Jeff Wood was wonderful company. Best um, content C-SPAN ever had. Yeah, exactly. Like, And the only, one of the few things on C-SPAN that is re-watchable. You know, <laughs> exactly. Uh, but... Like, it's got good rewatch value. But I, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, why the oh. hell did we choose to, after the Audacious Caucus, go into starting a Libertarian Socialist Caucus? Well, I was going to say, kind of, a, it's a, on a perfect, um, kind of, on that segue, um, <clears throat> in terms of, like, what ended up becoming the Libertarian Socialist Caucus, a great sort of historical relic, um, and it was kind of funny, recently someone, like, re they were like, I read the Audacious Caucus, and it's just a bunch of end caps, and I was thinking, like, well, because back in the day before we all became left libertarians, we were using the non-aggression principle, like, as the only tool that we had um, against the moderate Republicans and paleos were really super conflated with each other. And a lot of, there was a lot of crossover with the ANCAP vocabulary, but it was the non-aggression principle that they would fail to like really apply. So we were using that for our accountability tool. So I say that because if you look at the Audacious Caucus platform now in retrospect, the idea of someone describing it as like a bunch of ANCAPs, I went and looked, I was like, oh yeah, that's when we used to, promote what we later found out were Libsoft priorities using the non-aggression vocabulary. And I say that in answer to your question because, um, <clears throat> you know, that is eventually, that's kind of like a, the, the nap will only get you so far. It doesn't get you all the way to exploitation. So one of the things I remember, particularly with you, Logan, is sitting through platform committee meetings for the newly formed Libertarian Socialist Caucus. And I, something that we did that I still think is one of the greatest strokes of genius that we accomplished together, which is coming up with the non-exploitation principle. Yes. So we came up I, with a way to frame the Libsoc narrative as a deontological uh, axiom. frame, axi an axiomatic thank you foundation. And um, if I'm gonna interrupt really quick, uh, I think do. we have a fourth person who is waiting in, the, uh, in the lobby. I did not notice. Give me one second. 
Oh, there we are. Hello. Hey. Hi. Well, no problem. Hi, everyone. I'm Jay. Did you want to give? Yeah. Did you want to give yourself a short introduction of like, you know, yeah. how you got involved and stuff? Yes. So I'm relatively new, I'd say, compared to some others here, uh, new to political activism in general. You know, I've, I've been a libertarian socialist for a while, but as someone who leans more towards mutualism, I never felt like there was a place for me. But when Vermin Supreme was running, I learned for the first time that there was a socialist caucus of the Libertarian Party, you know. And, you know, so I, I joined, volunteered for the Vermin Supreme campaign, joined the Libertarian Socialist Caucus. Now with the Vermin Supreme campaign, you know, over for, for 2020, I'm, you know, trying to participate more in growing the caucus and building up Libertarian Socialists in the party. Nice, nice. So I believe we were talking about the early founding of the Libertarian Socialist Caucus at this point. If we would like to continue. Yeah, so I think we left off um, kind of like at the point where we came up with the non-exploitation principle. Yes, yeah, that was where it was. And I mean, I, I found that's really helpful, the non-exploitation principle in just a lot of people, the way that the Libertarian Party's mental framework works, I'm trying to pick my words nicely, the way the way the mental framework of the party works is that there's kind of like rules and, you know, everything, you know, you can kind of, there's different flavors of things, there's certain rules you can't break, there's there, there are certain, you know, you know, boundaries of, of certain things that are, that are good and bad, and it's based off of like these, you know, just core ideas that everyone sort of, co you know, collectively agrees to. And the NAP has been that for so long that um, having something like the NEP makes libertarian socialism something that people can innately grasp as a concept, even when they disagree with it, because they, they need that deontological framework. Like that's the party is built off of the deont deontology as a concept. Um, and so that was, I can't thank you guys enough for coming up with that. Um, I joined way after that was a thing. I found that to be so insanely helpful instead of doing the normal lib left, you know, 10 paragraph level explanation of a simple, of a simple concept. <laughs> I'm able to just take that image you guys made of the NEP, just post that and m m everyone pretty much gets it. Yeah. I think the huge, like it, it enabled us to say, Hey, we're not trying to change Liberty or take away from it. We're just adding this to it for us. And what do you say to that? What do you say to that? Here, here's a link to the full platform. If you see any violence there, let us know. Otherwise, I, we're good, right? And yeah, well, I guess we're good. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, and it also, there's a lot of libertarians who get really like, they always want to know about the edge cases. They want to know about what about this? What about this? What would you do about this situation? And having having an NEP allows them to have at least a a decent framework to answer that to feel like they can have a an answer to that question that they can that's predictable enough to them that they can develop a trust in it even if they don't fully agree with it whereas you know if they want to know what a libertarian socialist thinks and you you give the NEP yeah you know it's oversimplified a bit but they know you know sort of in advance kind of what a libertarian socialist will think so they there's a there's less fear whatever when they sort of understand in advance what what we believe you know, I was kind of curious, maybe Jay can tell me your um, reaction to like, as a, as a, someone who came from like outside, because we know that like, so we did that with the non-aggression principle because we were tuned to the right wing ear to the exist, you know, but like as someone who didn't come in, like already tuned to that, when you read our platform, did it strike you as jarring or like, what's the like overlap there? How did you feel about that language? Yeah. Well, for me personally, I, I also considered that it's, you know, it's kind of already a lot of the orthodox ideas of libertarian socialism, but kind of rearticulated in a way that could be understood, you know, by right libertarians. And so, 
I, I didn't really see anything that really disagreed with what I already believed in that sense. You know, and I'm a strong believer in, you know, changing the language that you use. You know, it, it's basically code switching, you know, speaking in a different way for a different audience so that they understand what you're actually getting at rather than just using jargon that's internal to your own community. You know, so I didn't really find it jarring at all because I, I understood that context. Cool. So all those platform committee meetings we sat through, Logan, they were all worth it. <laughs> Thank goodness. Yeah. Because <laughs> they were long. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, so the way that I have always approached this committee and one of the things that we didn't actually mention before as part of the founding and actually often gets overlooked, honestly, even by us, because the Socialist Caucus essentially became the face of this, more or less, um, even though was the uh, Libertarian Anti-Fascist Committee. Um, the Libertarian Anti-Fascist Committee, while not purely libertarian socialists, and that's a good thing, um, and that anti-fascist alliance still very much exists, um, and that's kind of become the bottom unity alliance in general, that of like sympathetic ANCAPs and... Uh, libertarian socialists who are willing to work with them. And it's been interesting. Sometimes there, I mean, there are definitely disagreements and it is interesting to discuss them. But one thing that I found is that they're a lot closer than I thought they would be a lot of the time. And the other thing is like, not only when I was, you know, uh, uh, not only when I was on Facebook, my brother on a lot of libertarian groups scrolling, I ended up, um, I very much ended up finding a lot of people who I already agreed with, but also I found a lot of people who were receptive to libertarian socialist ideas even if they didn't already agree with them. And that was the interesting thing for me. And I know, Mikester, you were kind of on the fence, too, originally. I mean, if anything, you were one of the Libertarian Socialist Caucus's first projects. Um, <laughs> um, it was. <laughs> yeah, counter-recruitment project. Um <laughs> Well, I was I if you're referring to like the debate over the name what we should name the caucus, is that what you're thinking of? Yeah, yeah. Because, oh yeah. Uh, I did not want us to be called the Libsock Caucus. And I remember it was so funny because like I was I was out that day and I was busy with other stuff, but I thought there's no way. And so I'm sitting there, oh, I trust you, I trust the wisdom of the body, just make the best choice. And like I'm thinking Black Flag Caucus is gonna win. I come back like a few hours later and I'm like, well, fuck. Here we go. You know, I, I think that's the, 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 <laughs> the best fight you ever lost, to be honest. Um, in yeah. retrospect. In retrospect, right. I agree. But, I just, the, you know, I, I knew there was a tipping point that we were at least approaching, if not already there. Or, I mean, if not, I mean, that was the tipping point. But I knew we had enough momentum bubbling for that tipping point to happen pretty damn soon. And I look at it as not only a kind of recruitment tool, but in talking about its origins in the Libertarian Anti-Fascist Committee, I look at it also more importantly, uh, in many respects, as an anti-fascist tool. We are there to, bottom unity does not mean willy-nilly uh, aligning ourselves with anyone who self-proclaims themselves as libertarians. 
regardless of what their actual beliefs are. If they are a libertarian uh, capitalist who, uh, you know, is, you know, if they're an ANCAP who lead, leans more towards anarchism and are basically just, you know, mutualist by other names, or even if they're, you know, Ralph Vardians, but genuinely anti-fascist, we can work with you. But, like, there's so many fascists and paleo libertarians who, you know, definitely um, just parade under the libertarian banner. And similar thing you saw happen with the national anarchist movement trying to infiltrate um the libertarian socialist movement not really finding as much success and then going towards ANCAPs and stuff like that. Um so it's really interesting. But I've seen it as a successful anti fascist campaign in many respects because I mean the anti fascist committee was founded when Richard Spencer came to the last International Students for Liberty conference before it was renamed LibertyCon. And Mikester and I were there. Richard Spencer tried to interrupt the event and stage his own fake panel in the lobby. And Students for Liberty tried to kick him out. Um, there was questions over whether he could or not because of, whether anybody could or not because it was public space eventually he was escorted out by security after a bunch of people yelled at him and it was really disappointing in many many ways and um I don't know I but at the same but it was really really satisfying to see the response and how people did shout him down and he had to be escorted out you know but it was disappointing to see that infiltration um so that was a really big coming together moment in figuring out who was our anti-fascist comrades and that ended up being a lot. I mean, with Richard Spencer, it was easy, you know, but then it ended up testing us as we started calling out other figures like Tom Woods and, uh, you know, and like Ron Paul and all these figureheads that like people that right libertarians take for granted. But it took a while to build up to that. It took just getting libertarian socialism accepted too but also the you know those were side by side things the between the fascist commit the libertarian anti-fascist committee and the um libertarian socialist caucus kind of jointly working together in anti-fascist work and i mean the campaign that we did to uh against Chris Rose when he ran. Um, now, Chris Rose was a libertarian, par actually he is probably still a libertarian party member in Florida. Oh, and for almost definitely, yeah. Knowing LP Florida. <laughs> so far to LP Florida. Love yeah. you guys, but come on. Oh, yeah. But, no, now I get to deal with LP, uh, now I get to deal with the a libertarian party in Louisiana. And, uh, well, this is the state that gave us David Duke. So we'll, see, you know, it's, it's interesting, but surprise, there are some surprising allies in, you know, both, both states. And I really, you know, have found some good allies in the LP surprisingly. Um, Especially the part of Louisiana that Kudamane is in, as really? far as yeah, it's the only real thing going on besides some really liberal Black Lives Matter rallies. Okay, and cool. by 
And by really liberal, I mean, like, they still invite politicians to come out to all their rallies to speak. I see. I see. I, mean, I, so, I do think that there's something else that you guys did that was um, that was the, very helpful. Uh, and that is you redefine the Overton window of what is called left in the party. Because uh, with the, you know, with the formation of the Libertarian Socialist Caucus and then sort of it getting kind of memed into everyone's brains across the party out of their this inability to stop sharing our content out of panic about the fact that we existed. Um, what, it, what it did was it took a lot of people who might have otherwise been concerned about being the left side of the party of being you know, too liberal, too, too left, who were, who were just normal libcaps who, who, who never joined the Libertarian Party with the concept of promoting a pipeline to fascism. You know, those people no longer had to be concerned about being the leftists in the party. We kind of gave them the space to to be able to feel like they didn't have you know that pressure of being the, the lefty in the party anymore when they were saying, No, I'm a libcap, but you know, but what is this what is this nonsense with promoting people from the League of the South? You know, they it, it gave a it gave a lot of room and it, and it freed up a lot of people who were under that that sort of kind of like social pressure to not really yeah, protest right. too much. And, and it, I think that that was, is hugely important because, I mean, I know that this is an opinion that isn't what necessarily shared by everyone here, but I, at least I hope you can understand where I'm coming from with it. I think that like within groups, like even like the Pragmatist Caucus for all of its flaws, you know, by having there being a libertarian socialist caucus, those people are no longer considered the left of the party, but the fact that they are, you know, even if they sometimes suck at the implementation, at least, you know, very much ideologically and, you know, in terms of what they post online, opposed to, to the pipeline, opposed to people like uh, Smith, people like Woods, the Mises Caucus. And that's happened because we showed, you know, that you, we showed first that libertarian socialism is a real thing with its own whole set of beliefs and that the lib left is an actual thing that isn't just libertarian capitalists that aren't outright racists. And then on top of that, we, we, by sort of have providing, and this is something I'm not as good at, but you're much better at Mike, uh, providing a sort of radical, you know, fuel in trying to, you know, take the blowtorch to, to the, uh, attempts to sort of, you know, if not cover for the fascists in the party, like, like not push that hard back against the people willing to, you know, be okay with them. Um, that sort of, you know, allowed them to be the people who, because you know, they were never going to push those people out directly themselves necessarily, to be the people that would, you know, follow up and and you know after we after you guys did the hard work of 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 exposing who these people are and whipping up consciousness about them, then going and you know voting those people down. And I don't know if that would have happened if it weren't for things like the anti-fascist caucus, like the audacious caucus, and like the libertarian socialist caucus. You know, I was thinking about that uh, myself earlier because, um, and I, this is probably a good moment to like plead to the audience that like, this is exhausting work. It does require a lot of patience. Um, so if you're listening and it resonates to you that like, it would really be fun to kind of like, you know, trigger the far right or whatever about it, like why it might appeal to you, even if you just want to come into the like online social spaces and you don't want to join, but like at least back us up because we get burnt out. And I say that because like recently a bunch of us all at once decided we're not burnt out anymore. Um, and it's amazing what just a little bit of effort, like it, it's like we see all these different projects sort of like crystallize back into like, the roles that Paul just really explained really well. And like, I forgot how like sort of symbiotic those different, like it's almost like a little, I don't want to use the word machine because it is very spontaneously ordered and it all happened just like naturally and flowing. And it's, it's an organic thing that we just like, no one premeditates it, but it's cool. And it has these different pieces and they do exactly what, Paul was just saying, and the Libsock uh, Industrial uh, Caucus. <laughs> we have a Libsock Industrial Complex. It's an anti-complex, or I don't know what you want to call it, but it's cool. <laughs> it's really fucking cool. And um, please join because we need you. <laughs> Bad. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, when Mikester talks about it being, you know, stressful work, um, it. So when I went to my first Libertarian Party meeting in Gainesville, Florida, when I lived there, like, that. And uh, when I first went to my first Libertarian Party meeting there, there was um, this... They had a few candidates running, but Chris Rose was one of them. And for those who do not know, Chris Rose is a member of the American Guard, which is a... uh, I mean, it's a fascist group straight up. They disguise themselves as, oh, we're a bunch of bikers and heathens and blah, blah, blah. And they're not that. You know, they're really not. And it's a guy... Civic nationalist, if I remember correctly. Yes, they are. They explicitly describe themselves as a civic nationalist organization. And Chris Rose is you know, sitting there, we're talking about his campaign and the man's wearing five different Confederate flags and has a Confederate flag phone case and wallet and a keychain. Like, it was... That's excessive. Like, you could have stopped... He, he would have stopped at three of them. He didn't need all five. Yeah. And he should... I mean, he would show up to city commission meetings wearing rebel flags. He would... Or... Bolo ties and cowboy hats. Um, the cowboy hat thing is a little cool. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. He also has a baby face, so it always looks so funny whenever he wore it, to be honest. Um, but not to, you know, it just it just was an odd clothing choice for his, his body. Um, his face, I mean. But it was interesting, um, the hat specifically, because it just sat weird. But he he showed up to city commission meetings all the time to defend our local Confederate statue, even though it was on public land, being paid for by tax dollars. And libertarians think taxation is theft or something. I don't know. And so it's definitely, it it was definitely a moment where I had to bite my tongue completely and just sit there and take notes in my head because I realized at that point, when they were that far into this dude's campaign, I wasn't going to stop them, but I wasn't going to stop them from running him. And he wasn't going to stop running himself. So we ended up running one of our other friends who is a libertarian socialist and at the time was the coordinator of our local anarchist info shop in the area, the Civic Media Center, um, second largest info shop in the, or second longest uh, running info shop in the U.S. And it's, it was amazing seeing her be able to run a campaign while being the coordinator at info shop and being a student. Um, it was a soil and water commission campaign Um, He was running unopposed. So this was the thing that made us realize that we needed to run her. Was, as someone who does not put much faith into into electoralism, I campaigned hard for Kathleen because, I mean, she... She not only she not only deserved the position a lot more than him. He we could not risk a fascist getting into even a low level position like that. And so we ended up really pushing hard. And I had a lot of encouragement from the Libertarian Socialist Caucus 
and some endorsement for members and such. So it was really, it was really interesting to see Libertarian Socialist Caucus folks working, you know, like working and supporting a non-libertarian party <laughs> candidate when it meant combating the worst of the libertarian party as it is today. And I am under no um, like Ill illusion that we are going to take over this party or that this party is even salvageable, in my opinion. But I do think that there are a lot of good people worth reaching out to. And I think there are a lot of fascists worth deplatforming. And so with him running unopposed, we realized the only thing to do was to run a libertarian socialist candidate that an, an anti-fascist candidate for the Soil and Water Commission uh, position so that he wasn't running unopposed. Because if he was running unopposed, he would have even been on a damn ballot. He would have just been a shoe in And we made sure to have a fallback and there was one other position that was open and hadn't had any candidates running that was on the same Soil and Water Commission, um, but a different chair. And we ran our own candidate unopposed. They, you know, were a shoe-in. And, you know, they're a socialist, but not a libertarian socialist. But at the same time, they were... They were a strong anti-fascist candidate, so it was really, really worth it. And I, I don't know. Like it showed me that there is sometimes a time and a place for electoralism as a means of activism, and especially anti-fascism and harm reduction. So, you know, I don't think every race is that drastic. Um, but at the same time, that really was, and I think that showed the importance of why we need to be doing this type of work in the LP and why you should go to your local Libertarian Party meeting, not with the idea that you will make friends. Yes, you will. You will. Absolutely. And with the Socialist Caucus, you can now be a lot more open about your beliefs within the party and you have a caucus of people to back you up um but it is still something that you want to navigate with caution you might not want to announce it outright first meeting and you might also sometimes want to collect notes and bring it back to any other activist organizations you were part of to help combat some of the other shit, because that's exactly what we did, is we got the Gainesville Anti-Fascist Committee involved, and they ran her campaign, while I continued to go to Libertarian Party meetings there, and, you know, collect information on his campaign, acting like I was willing to help. And now, they, since then, they disaffiliated with him. Um, there was a formal, like, vote to disaffiliate with him. And that party has, or that particular affiliate has cleaned up quite a bit. So you can affect change. Mm -hmm. A little bit goes farther than you think. And I'm, <clears throat> that's probably a good, um, a good segue to remind, or just maybe if it's not apparent or, you know, you, you, you think, oh, it's a political party and you assume that, it has a, a fully functioning structure and <laughs> that's actually not true. A lot of counties don't have a, a, a county committee at all. Um, so you and your friends can just become it. Like you don't even have to, you know, meet the others and run for board positions. You just, you're the committee. Um, and the other cool thing I like that you brought out Logan is that like, like I'm under no illusions that they're like, of a takeover or like a takeover even being needed because um, what I found is that most libertarians, most um, ordinary grassroots rank and files, libertarians um, 
they're in it because they genuinely want a world set free. And the more you introduce them to like the analysis, not so much the labels because sometimes they like, I'm not a socialist. I'm a capitalist. Well, like, okay. But like it, when you get into the analysis, like they still like, they, they like it. They actually like it. And so they, they like, love it. Yeah. <laughs> Half the time. Like the, I, the craziest thing is I think anyone who's hung around people in the libertarian party that, are uh, try to justify their beliefs. And when you ask about the question of, well, won't this just result in, you know, the rich controlling everything? They talk about their opposition to crony capitalism. But when you unpack what they mean by crony capitalism and what they envision as, a, as an actual free market, it's usually most of the time sort of like like a, a mean version of mutualism, like half of the time, like, like, it's not like a good version, but it's like, like, and it's, it's, that's usually kind of what they actually mean. And, uh, you know, I, I totally agree with what you're saying that there's so many more people in the party that are a lot that don't even really grasp that in practice, they're actually pushing for what in the, what in reality, if it was ever implemented is actually anti-capitalism. I do think the people who are talking about, um, I think the, the 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 conservatives, or like real conservatives, I'm not talking Libertarian Party, who talk about you know, the Libertarian Party, the libertarianism will actually breed socialism. I think they they're actually correct, and that the, the libcaps who who push back and say no, no, it doesn't. You know, we're pro promoting freedom and free markets. I don't I don't think they actually understand understand what they're actually promoting. <laughs> Yeah, I actually go back and forth between wondering if like sometimes I like I'm really mad at Rothbard. Like, why the fuck did he try to flip the capitalist script? And then I I went like maybe he was an evil genius and like because if you think about it, like he tricked them into like Paul said, essentially promoting anti-capitalism on, on it, like not knowing it, not knowing it. And I think that's funny. <laughs> I, I think he eventually sadly lost his mind a little. Just because of how how deep he went on that, um, yeah, his his late life is a little unfortunate. To see how close Rothbard really was during his leftist years, I mean, sorry, how close left Rothbardianism is to real anarchism. Because actually, looking through Rothbard's left years, there are some problematic things. Looking back in retrospect, such as his advocacy of the Black Panthers being more about how it was. It was still very much coming from a racist point of view. Of they, you know, at least it was. It was very much, you know, he was very much able to reconcile his views of supporting the Black Panthers and David Duke on some nationalist bullshit because he said that they were more nationalist than Marxian, and that was that might be his, the worst take on the on, on the Black Panthers I've ever heard outside of Ronald Reagan's. Holy yeah, and so it's like. I mean, his support for David Duke didn't become a, an explicit thing until later, and I'm not sure whether it was a thing that or not when it, you know, before we knew about it explicitly. But like in his later paleo conservative days, and he started, you know, championing David Duke, and people saw that as like a very uh, uh, contradictory point of view, for, uh, like a complete 180 from his advocacy of the Panthers. But when you look at his analysis, that you know he thought. And, you know, he criticized them for turning away from nationalism and embracing Marxism. And that never happened. They were a Maoist organization to begin with, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, did, did he just never listen to anything that they ever said? Like, did he just, like, get his view on them, like, because he saw a headline once? Like, that's that's a, that's a surprise surprisingly unsophisticated take for him given that even when he's wrong he's very in depth about how wrong he is that's that's pretty i i do appreciate the analysis that while marxist in rhetoric they were far more libertarian in action in that they saw no uh they saw no hope of taking over this state, really. So they didn't try to. 
So they actually operated on a libertarian socialist level, even though they tended to be more authoritarian, you know, Marxist, Leninist, Maoists. Very and dual power. So, yeah. So that's why you've seen them be such an influence on modern American anarchism to this day, especially the prison abolitionist movement. Um, so it, it's, I don't know, it's just interesting. But yeah, Rothbard, even during his left years, was not that great, apparently. But, so I tried to look in a little bit about um, what happened with Rothbard and the left, and, and um, people who actually read books might know more than me on this, but it's, it looks kind of, from everything I've been able to figure out about it, it kind of looks like what Roth Rothbard really was at his heart of hearts, an old right guy. And, you know, he had his, his anarcho-capitalism theory and everything. But in practice, you know, it still essentially was he was the old right person from that he always started with. And so what he was looking for from the new left when he tried to work with them was to get the new left to to support um, like much more uh, destruction of, of economic priorities that the left has. When it comes to you know potentially the the even the slightly status left, you know things like like the welfare state for example was a, was a big problem he had with with the new left that he couldn't get them on board about abolishing the welfare state, but it, it almost seems like how like he he didn't really process them for who they really were and just saw them as people who could be useful idiots maybe for 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 his priorities and he kept getting mad at the at the left for being unwilling to focus on the parts of state reduction that he cared about the most, which largely, I shouldn't say largely, it, a big part of that was, you know, taking apart the welfare state and doing so pretty much immediately um, without any thought about building the infrastructure for which people who would need assistance would be able to then move on to in a voluntary society. So it, it's always, he always looked to me a little bit like selfish with that, that he would, you know, he got mad that he couldn't convince the left to, you know, basically to do what he wanted and that they were their own separate group that was willing to make an alliance, but not willing to change all their priorities just because he wrote some like bazillion page manifesto in some libertarian journal one day. Um, I'm sorry, that's probably a little disrespectful of him, I guess. Uh, but like that, that really is the impression that I've gotten. And when you look at what, like his history with, um, with that that pe was that that peace and freedom party that that thing uh, out of California um, that had like a, a libertarian wing and a and a, a democratic socialist wing, where you look at the libertarians that were associated with the SDS, um, just the way that he these that his factions would always try to pull these wild power moves over the left. It's I I can't blame the the people on the left who who interacted with him and his elk for being like, fuck these people. Like, I, I, I can't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, and I mean, my goal with this caucus was not so much to ever recruit leftists to the Libertarian Party. You know, in fact, the exact opposite to recruit right wingers out of the Libertarian Party. Um, but at the same time, to do so requires us to recruit some leftists to the Libertarian Party. Um, so it, it is a thing where we do want to make more of those alliances. We do want folks who are willing to do these type of this type of work and you know the people that we get involved from the libertarian right it you don't have to leave the libertarian party get involved with the caucus like just because i i don't and you know leftists if they want to run for office if they want to do things like do that you know just because that's my view of the caucus. I'm not the caucus. This is a democratic organization. The caucus is whatever the hell anyone involved makes it. So get involved. And how do people get involved? Paul, you, you've got the latest 
um, non hiatus details. I guess. <laughs> um, so they can get involved at in a few ways. If they want to act, sign up to be like a member of the caucus, they can go to bit.ly slash lsc dash lp, I believe it is. Let's see. Dash, let me just check, make sure I got it right. Yep, bit.ly slash lsc dash lp. I don't know, whoever is the, uh, the admin on the on the stream yard here, maybe they can make a little, little banner thing. Um, Tell me again. Sorry, I was checking about the, to our next panel. No worries, it's in the private chat. Um, what that consists of is literally is just filling out a really basic, um, you know, little form, part one, uh, and then part two is they have to uh, take the link that's on there uh, for the free membership part of you know website in the Libertarian Party itself and sign up for a free membership with the party, which is a thing you can actually do. You don't have to even register with your board of elections although you want to I'm definitely not going to say no that especially if you're in new york state uh definitely do that but uh if you're even if you're not um or you you want to stay in whatever party you're in or you don't want to register with the board of elections don't want to legit legitimize it or or you're not there you don't want to you know formally fully join the party if you if you go to uh you know to the forum on the on that url there on the screen it gives you a link to the free membership section of the party um, and just sign up for that free membership. It, 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 you just have to, they basically just ask you to agree to the NAP and put in a, your, your name and email. Um, and then just email over the proof that you fill that out to our email address, prove that you're a member and boom, you're in. It's, it's basically filling out two forms and emailing to us that you filled out one of those forms. We also have a Facebook group, uh, a discussion group, which uh, you don't have to be part of the caucus to join. You can just join it. Um, and uh, Chancellor, anyone watching this stream is definitely going to be admitted into it. Uh, called the LSC-LP discussion group. Uh, and we are we have you know a Facebook page, a Discord, a Twitter, even an Instagram that we'll, we sometimes post things to a lot of different ways to get involved. Awesome. Well, we are going to wrap this up and transition into our Fire Your Arms panel. So definitely stick around for that. Um, I will be joined by an amazing uh, cast of armed leftists and libertarians. So, hell yeah. It was wonderful to have y'all on and I'm glad we do this. Thank you so much for helping promote the caucus and doing all the work that you do. Hope y'all have a happy, happy Mardi Gras. You too. Happy Mardi Gras. Happy Mardi Gras. <laughs> all right. Y'all have a great one. Thank you.